Birmingham's historic Rickwood Field. So we invite you to come back out again next Thursday to see 42. Admission to Alabama in the movies is free, as is the air conditioning. <laughs> so we do make a charge for the concessions, though. And this program is sponsored by the Friends of the Alabama Archives. Our next during our long-running Food for Thought program will be held on Thursday, August the 18th at noon, and the speaker is Laura Newland-Hill from the Encyclopedia of Alabama at Auburn University. Laura will be talking to us about the Montgomery Motor Corps and the work they did for the home front during World War I. This is one of those interesting programs that begins with a question about a photograph in the archives collection and grows from there. So you'll definitely want to come back and hear about Laura's research into the Montgomery Motor Corps. Registration for our uh, for our final two summer genealogy workshops is now open. That registration caps at 80 participants per program, so you'll want to go on our website, archives.alabama.gov, and register for that as soon as possible. Those programs will be Saturday, August 12th. That program will be on African American genealogy. On Saturday, September 17th, the program will be on census research, and as you may know, there was a new census. The 1950 census was just, uh, just opened up for research just a few months ago, so it's very timely to have these two presentations here. Uh, the cost for each of these workshops is $30 for the public, $20 for students, and $20 for members of the Friends of the Archives group. And that fee includes a box lunch, and the workshops are sponsored by the Friends of the Alabama Archives. That's the third time in these announcements I've mentioned to you the Friends group. And so if you would like more information about how to join the Friends, you can find that outside on the table uh, next to the coffee and the water, or you can see me afterwards. We would love to have you join our support organization. Uh, a reminder that all of our Food for Thought programming this year is presented with the financial support in memory of Mike Jenkins. Our speaker today, Rolandis Rice, is a native of Atlanta, Georgia. He holds a master's degree in history from right here at Alabama State University and a PhD in history from right down the road at Auburn University. He served as special assistant to Dr. Bernice King at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change in Atlanta, where he supervised research, communications, and the archives. His research is focused squarely on the modern civil rights movement, and Rice is currently the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi. We asked Dr. Rice to come talk about his new book from the University of South Carolina Press on the life of Hosea Williams. Hosea Williams, as you uh, know, has a lot of connections to the Alabama civil rights movement, only probably a few that you know of, some more that you'll no doubt learn about today. So join me in welcoming Dr. Alondis Rice. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me thank my good friend, Scotty, for the wonderful introduction. And let me just thank each of you for coming out today to hear this little talk on, on Hosea Williams. And I know that we don't have a lot of time, but I don't very often get a chance to uh, serve in a professorial capacity. So I miss the classroom. So if you see me getting a bit carried away, just understand why. Uh, I'm back in my element because sitting behind the desk all day signing papers and, and, and doing the administrative things is just not as fun as what we're doing here today. So certainly want to thank uh, Dr. Colvin. Uh, she is my Auburn sister. We attended Auburn together. Uh, let me thank Ms. Meredith McDonough and uh, Mr. Cole Smith for they have done a wonderful job in facilitating today's talk. Um, so in February, I was asked to visit a, a very elite prep school in Nashville, Tennessee. And this was my first time speaking about the civil rights movement to um, an audience from kindergarten through the 12th grade, um, an all white institution. And so I said, how in the world can I spell out the essence of the civil rights movement and equality from an audience beginning in kindergarten, ranging all the way to the 12th grade. And so, uh, as you heard from my introduction, I'm a historian, so I'm not a mathematician. Uh, I'm not good at, in any way in mathematics. But um, I remember this diagram when I was a child. Greater than, less than, and equal to. 
And I would argue, and as I shared with that precocious group, I think I'm going to take off this jacket. That's okay. Not because it's hot in here. I just don't want to. Let's see. Now, usually when I wear a suit, I don't iron the back of my shirt because it's <laughs> because it takes too much time. Luckily, I think I did iron today, so you all can't laugh. I mean, Dr. English, good to see you. Dr. English, my major professor from all Alabama State, is here. Dr. English was also He's going to get mad for me for calling him out. He was the first African-American to finish the PhD in history at Auburn. And me, his student, I was the second. Um, so certainly he did a good job at lifting while climbing. Um, so greater than, less than, and equal to. Again, arguing that all of our issues in society or even amongst the world can be traced back to this very simple diagram. One group instinctively, instinctively thought that they were greater than. Another group was made to feel less than. But at the end of the day, one would argue that we are still all equal to. And so uh, this was my little way of trying to reach and connect uh, those students uh, in Tennessee. So I thought it, it would be wise for me just to play a very brief book trailer. It's no more than about three minutes in duration. Let's see. It's very difficult to solve an argument between any two groups of citizens, black and white or otherwise, unless the leaders of the two groups are eager to see a solution to the problem. I personally do not think that Hosea Williams is seeking a solution. He's not trying to establish communications between the blacks and the whites. I think he is trying to get publicity for himself and to create dissension. And this makes it very difficult for those in the black community who have a legitimate grievance or for the white leaders who are seeking to avoid disturbances in their own community and to meet legitimate grievances to get together to work the problem out. When those come in from the outside and agitate, it's wrong. It's wrong in the black community, it's wrong in the black community, it's particularly for a community like Columbus, Georgia, where the people are getting along to have somebody come out and create and precipitate trouble. Are you putting the finger on Mr. Williams as the cause of the weekend trouble in Columbus? Very specific. On Jose Williams, chief racist. We bring you today to Forsyth County, Georgia, just 30 miles north of Atlanta, which in the past few weeks has gained the reputation of being a hotbed of racism and the current battlefield of the civil rights movement. He is Jose Williams and others led them across that bridge. And we've all seen the film, the footage, the photographs. The session of the temporary units, because this is what the coalition rejected. The board yeah. promised we do not have to go to Superintendent. The board promised us an answer to our families. We are citizens of this community. And we uh, want an answer. And this is why you're not giving an answer. We're not going to take no jack. We want an answer to our children. So each time I play this video, I always ask before I proceed if there are any questions. All right. So this was a providential project for me. Um, when I was a graduate student at Auburn, I was initially going to write my dissertation on the Alabama Democratic Conference. And I wrote a prospectus and I thought it was very good. 
my major professor, Dr. Carter, also thought it was very good. But then he says, well, Rolandus, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, the soon-to-be Dr. Larry McLemore, Larry is now the head of school at St. James. He said, well, Larry has already written his dissertation and it consumed a lot of the ADC, so you're going to have to do something different. So I was in my office at the library at Alabama State at the time, and I said, what in the world could I write about? And number one, I had to think of a topic where I knew I would have the sources. And out of nowhere, literally, I thought about Jose Williams. And I did a quick Google search. I called Dr. Carter. I said, Carter, what do you think about doing something on Jose Williams? He said, well, Rice, I don't think there is, has been a, uh, a treatment on Jose. So let's just see what you can find. So I'm from Atlanta. And we found out that his collection was at the Auburn Avenue Research Library. And it was nearly a ready-made dissertation. The organizers of that collection, I think, did a magnificent job. And so um, it really started prior to graduate school. My mother, you see her in the top left corner, Every year during the summer, I would attend the Samuel L. Jones Boys and Girls Club in Atlanta, in East Atlanta. And I started going when I was around seven years old. And my mother would point every morning and say, that's where old crazy Jose Williams lives. <laughs> and she used different terms depending on the day, depending on how he was being portrayed in the news. And... Of course, I had no idea that one day I would write about Jose Williams. I only knew that I heard of him in the news and my mother said he was crazy. So that was interesting enough for me. But also about my mother, I remember vividly her taking me to the Apex Museum, which is also on Auburn Avenue in Atlanta. And it's actually right across the street from the museum from the library rather. And you see the Boys and Girls Club where I attended, um, but it was really at Alabama State University. At the time, ASU was vying for the third stop on the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail, which is now on the campus. And that's when I really learned so much more about the Selma to Montgomery March and Hosea Williams' role in it. At the time, I did not know that his a uh, lifetime commitment to civil and human rights extended just beyond uh, what happened in Selma. I have a picture of my wife um, because for years, even on our vacations, I was reading a book. So I never had much fun. And uh, luckily for me, the cocktail glass, we somehow found a way to move it out of the picture. So I did that in the event that my grandmother saw this. Um, but the last picture, in 2014, I was working for Dr. Bernice King, and I had the honor of meeting Ambassador Andrew Young. And he learned about the dissertation because I had not yet finished uh, the project. And he said, well, you should turn it into a book once you're able to finish. And we stayed in contact. He did a few interviews with me and agreed to write the forward. Um, so I did not in any way have a role in putting this train of events in motion. I really do argue that it was a providential project. So um, I often speak of my children, and I know you all really want to hear about Jose, but I think it's important to talk about how all this really came about. Um, again, did most of the research at the Auburn Avenue Library, and at the time, my oldest daughter, Madison, was three, and she spent so much time with me uh, on these research excursions. But in that collection, it was really a roadmap to Jose's life. I mean, they had newspaper articles as early as the 1960s. I saw his personal writings. I was able to see through his own words how he felt, how he thought, his communication with even world leaders. Uh, but also some very important video and photographic footage that really helped to paint him in a fuller picture for me. Um, but Dorothy Cotton... Dorothy Cotton was at one point the highest ranking woman in SCLC. And you see how she speaks of a conversation she had with King during a meeting. And she says, well, uh, Martin needed Hosea in one way. 
He needed some others in other ways. But at the end of the day, King said, who is going to get out on the streets and organize the way Hosea does? Andrew Young described Hosea Williams as a madman. And I, I played with different titles for the book. I said, should I call it the mad scientist of the civil rights movement? And the editor said, right, that's a little bit too corny because he was a scientist. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. But this was a mad man with a good heart for people and humanity. And I was very careful while writing the book because as one of the reviewers said, Rice, you seem as if you are worshiping Hosea Williams. And so I had to be as detached as I possibly could. Um, and I don't know if, if scholarly objectivity uh, is evident at all times, but I tried my best. Now, I was going to play another video. I may come back to that a little bit later. Um, this is Hosea Williams, classic Hosea Williams. This picture was probably uh, in the early 1970s. And you see the reactions from folks in the room. There's a very distinguished gentleman who's well-dressed, who's covering his nose. And the guy who's on the receiving end of Hosea's tongue lashing, um, he doesn't appear to be too happy with what Hosea is telling him. And what you all are seeing here is Hosea Williams all day, every day. When trying to figure out the best way to describe Hosea Williams, um, reading a book and realized that he epitomized what one scholar called an organic intellectual. This is someone who was not the ivory tower intellectual like Dr. English and Professor Caver. Uh, and not saying that they are anything wrong with being a traditional intellectual. But Jose Williams was one who thought that he could change the world by appreciating and understanding the needs and aspirations of the group that he belonged to by the choice of circumstance. But I highlighted this bottom part in red, or put it in red text rather, that um, an organic intellectual is someone who is so firmly committed to social action that it is inextricably woven into the fabric of their existence. For Jose Williams, social action was all consuming. It was indivisible from his personhood. Now, if you look at me today, you may not tell that I was once an athlete. And no, of course, I didn't play football. Um, but I love playing baseball. And I love to watch the Hall of Fame enshrinement ceremony every year. And while I was a little kid, I would collect baseball cards. Right now, I have a, a Babe Ruth baseball card, and it may be a reprint, so don't nobody try to follow me home. <laughs> but on the back of a baseball card, it shows a person's stats or the justification of why one merits enshrinement in the hall of some of the greatest athletes. So we know that Hosea was arrested more than 100 times. And all the time it was not uh, for civil rights movement related activities. We'll talk about that. Um, three pieces of landmark legislation, Hosea Williams was a part uh, in playing a role. We know that Jose Williams' charity provided more than one million free meals. We know that by age 61, Jose was still leading marches, and this was the march in Forsyth County um, in the 1980s, 20,000 marchers. Jose Williams invented one new method of protest, the dreaded night march. So all this is in the book. But last, at age 72, he was still protesting. So my, my professor at Alabama State, Dr. Archer, she would always tell me, Rolandis, the title is A Contract with the Reader. 
So when the title of the book is Jose Williams, A Lifetime of Defiance and Protest, his stat sheet confirms that he did indeed have a lifetime of protesting. So the book is arranged chronologically into 10 chapters. Certainly, I would not go through each of these. Um, but Jose Williams was born to a blind mother and a blind father. He was raised, so his mother and father met at the Macon School for the Colored Blind in Georgia. Now, this is pre Great Depression. Jose Williams was raised by his grandfather, Turner. And they called him Papa. And he couldn't read, but they said, no matter what you do, you couldn't cheat him. So during my, one of my research trips, I visited Atapogas, Georgia, which is where Jose was born. And the area still bears Turner Williams' name. Now, Jose said, and I had to kind of question Jose, he said, when the 1930s, Papa was able to get the government to pave a road go, going to Papa's house. I said, man, that's pretty interesting. Um, in the 1930s, a black man who could not read was able to convince the city to have a road paved to the house. Well, I did some research going through some newspapers and some government workers, and Jose was indeed telling the truth. And I had to check Jose multiple times to ensure that what he was saying was indeed accurate. But Jose um, fought in World War II. And he was, he served for several months only to return home to be beaten within an inch of his life. So you survive tyranny abroad only to be ki almost killed in, in Georgia. He goes to Atlanta and he studies chemistry at Morris Brown. So I think that someone in this room has probably already thought about the connection with civil rights activists having STEM backgrounds. Jose Williams had a degree in chemistry. Rav Abernathy had a degree in mathematics. Andrew Young had a degree in biology. So there is something connecting these analytical activists. So he eventually earns the degree in chemistry, uh, works for the United States Postal Service, and I think you all will realize that that just did not do much for Jose Williams. So he moves to Savannah, Georgia, and he begins working for the United States Department of Agriculture as a research scientist. And Jose Williams thought that he arrived he was making relative good money. He had a white secretary. In his mind, that was a visible sign of upward mobility. And he had a nice home. But then he realized that something just was not right in the office. And the way Jose describes it in his preparation for the job, he writes that there were some of his white colleagues who could take a machine apart and put it back together again. He said, this was the first time I even saw these instruments. Jose Williams was also a published scientist. He published in uh, the Academic Journal of the Day in 1956. So he was committed to his job. He was committed to his upward mobility as a research scientist. But then a black man is killed in Savannah by a police officer. Uh, he joins the local NAACP, the Savannah, the Savannah branch, working with uh, another man, W.W. W. Law, who was also a STEM major working for the federal government. So uh, Hosea said they were the civil rights twins. Um, Ho Law led the branch and Hosea was over the membership committee, the fundraising committee. And Hosea realized that he had a knack for organizing. Um, and by 1961, 62, um, what happened during those few years, uh, we would realize that it led Savannah, Georgia to be what King called uh, the first desegregated big city in the South prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, we know about Hosea and Selma and the Voting Rights Act of 65. I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. Um, you will see that um, Hosea participated uh, in the Chicago Fair Housing Campaign. 
um, uh, chapter eight focuses on what was the movement after King. You know, those brilliant historians in the back, they talk about this long civil rights movement. Um, chapters nine and 10 cover Hosea's political career uh, in Georgia. This slide, it brought Hosea's family to tears during the initial book launch. So there's this concept of historical memory. Sunday, March 7th, 1965. Um, you see what the historian W. F. Brundage speaks about when he says historical memory um, is the product of intentional creation. Sunday morning, March 7th, 1965, Jose Williams is on the phone with Dr. King. And the reflections of that conversation have varied, but the minimum facts are this. Jose wants to march. King says no. Called it off. He says, Hosey, his nickname for Jose, Hosey, you're not ready. You don't have the provisions. You haven't really planned this thing out. Jose says, well, King, I have them marching all over the church. They are on fire and they are ready to go. There's a back and forth conversation between King and, and, and Jose Williams. And uh, they get off the phone. Jose is alerted that King is going to dispatch Andrew Young via charter plane to come down to stop the march. So Young arrives in Montgomery that morning, and he says, and I write about it in the book, his ultimate goal was to stop the march up until the very last minute. So Jose Williams, after being told no, he proceeds with planning the march anyway. Now, if I tell my boss no, uh, there's a chance that Rice may not have a job tomorrow. Um, Jose understood what was at stake. So uh, this is one example of Hosea pulling for what I call his arsenal of agitation. It was Hosea's obstinacy and insubordination that led to Lewis's immortality. When we see um, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, whether it's in a cartoon, whether we see it in a book, um, we don't ever see Jose Williams' name, image, or likeness attached to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Even in Atlanta, there was an exhibit at the High Museum some years ago. And the famous picture of them on the bridge that morning, you would see Jose, you would see uh, John Lewis, but uh, Jose's face had been cropped out of the picture. And this was not, I think, anything nefarious or intentional, but folks just did not know. It was this slide that led me to say that the eyes adjust to darkness. If we are in a room and the lights are on, but when the lights go off, you can't see anything. But within a few seconds, your eyes begin to adjust. You begin to see just a little bit. Um, so I would argue this is the same phenomenon that happened with um, John Lewis and Jose Williams as it relates to that fateful day in Selma, March 7th, 1965. Uh, I wasn't around on this day, but I'm sure many of you remember this famous speech from Lyndon Johnson. He said, at times, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. In other words, what happened in Selma, Alabama, Lyndon Johnson equates to the beginning of the Revolutionary War and the ending of the Civil War, birth and rebirth. And he's equating what happened in Selma with these two uh, major events in American history. We've all seen this picture before. Now, the morning that King and Jesse Jackson and Abernathy and Jose were going to the airport, Jose made a joke. He said that 
you know, it was always argued in the civil rights camp that King would not be killed by an assassin's bullet, but he would be killed in a car wreck because they, he was always running late going to an airport, trying to get, get on a plane. And King responded back and said, well, I would much rather be known as Martin Luther King, who's always late, than the late Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> but this morning on the plane, and I've heard it from uh, different people in, in different contexts, that um, King just felt airy that morning. And the pilot says, everybody, please be patient. We have Martin Luther King Jr. on the plane. We want to make sure that uh, no one's safety uh, is being jeopardized. And so that sort of was an ominous tone for this trip to Memphis. When I was in graduate school, one of my questions on my qualifying exam was discuss 1968. And if one could imagine, you know, you could certainly fill up uh, a few pages of notes on discussing 1968. One author called it a spontaneous combustion of rebellious spirits. You had the Tet Offensive, you had race riots. King is killed on April 4th. LBJ decides not to seek re-election. Bobby Kennedy is killed a few months thereafter. I found this picture, and I think this was uh, in the Alabama, in you all's archives. This is Jose Williams uh, loading the casket onto the plane uh, in Memphis. This picture. Now, my, I have two favorite movies, and I don't know if that's oxymoronic, but I love Lean on Me, and I love The Godfather. This image reminds me of something Godfather-like. Um, if where do we go from here was a picture. You see one who thinks that he should be the heir apparent. You see a gentleman who is the heir apparent, who feels like he's earned the right to be the heir apparent, but not really as confident in walking in what was ahead of him. You see Andrew Young as if he's questioning, man, am I going to stick around? And you see Jose Williams holding something in his hand. I cannot decipher what that box is, but he is still looking forward. My interpretation. Now, this picture was taken um, at the service at Southview Cemetery in Atlanta. Um, at the time, Jose was 42 years old. By this time, he had led the desegregation of public accommodations in Savannah, was a critical force in the St. Augustine movement, orchestrated Bloody Sunday, and certainly had a hand in the protest that led to the Civil Rights Act of 64 and Voting Rights Act of 65. So if Jose Williams did nothing else after this date, he would have been recognized as a first ballot founding father. And you're probably saying, right, founding father is a very lofty term. What, what would make Jose be deserving of such a recognition? I'll talk about it. So there are several themes I discuss in the book. Um, I relied on a lot of articles in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. Jose was known as Atlanta's best known motorist. All right. He was known for driving with a suspended license. He had 26 moving violations over a 10 year period. Um, at least 130 arrests. And certainly all of those were not related to civil rights activism. Um, one author said that Jose was always dealing with a combustible mix of alcohol and drugs. Um, another author said that Jose Williams was a mixture of Huey Long and Huey Newton. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Jose always argued that they're only trying to silence me because I'm the only one in the black leadership who is going to hold people accountable. And he was almost convicted of one of these incidents. And if he had been convicted, he would have forfeited his seat. But this, everybody, June 7th of 75, 
uh, Judge Henley was a local magistrate judge who was ultimately elected to the Georgia Supreme Court. Now, the interesting component is there was a poll by attorneys in 1975, and that poll revealed that Judge Henley was the least qualified jurist to be in the race for the Georgia Supreme Court. Well, Judge Henley was particularly harsh on Hosea Williams for his driving record. So Hosea always argued that Henley used him as a vehicle to drive his career forward. Nevertheless, Henley permanently suspends Hosea's license. So Hosea, in his classic trademark approach to market himself and the cause, he purchases a 10-speed bike. And you see... The picture here, this is his own press release where he makes the steps, uh, makes a speech from the steps of the state capitol. He says, I will not be silenced if I have to ride the bike or even skate for the rights of black and poor people. I'll continue fighting for my people until we are free or until I am dead. Jose Williams fought up until the very end for his people. And that does not necessarily mean just black people, but black people, poor people, white people. He fought for um, everyone. Now, he said, I may not have my driver's license, but I still have my dignity and my self-respect. This is a blown up picture of him purchasing a nice suit and his bike to make a statement that you may have taken my license, but you have not taken my freedom. This is another article that I pulled from the AJC. And he is in short in the tradition of American populism, which has always included figures who combine brains, rascality, voter appeal, and the guts and availability to speak an uncomfortable truth. Now, Hosea Williams, he went to court at least 70 times, had 70 trials. There was not an all-black jury in Atlanta that would convict him of anything. They called him the Teflon Don of Atlanta because nothing would stick when it involved him and a jury. This is particularly interesting. During another episode, Jose was running for a district seat, District 54. Now, we all agree that there was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was no Google. There was no internet. Um, there was no method to campaign other than shaking hands, going to doors, and kissing babies. Jose was locked up for a year and he won his election anyway now this is a quote and I had to circle it for you now the constitution did not give Jose Williams any latitude they covered his every move Mr. Mullen that's good to see you it says the constitution's endorsement of representative Jose Williams is based on his effectiveness as a legislator which is okay and not his effectiveness as a driver, which is not. <laughs> but the AJC endorsed him while he was in jail and he won the election anyway. So that tells you about his effectiveness as a legislator. Mrs. Boone, it's good to see you too. And this is Hosea's um, own press release, Georgia jail civil rights vet wins re-election. He, he was a machine unto himself when marketing and publicizing his own calls. Now, when I was doing my research, I came across a variety of terms used to describe Hosea. Bombastic, belligerent, wrongheaded, a sinister organizing genius bull in a china shop but he was larger than life predictable and unpredictable now this this next one is one is particularly interesting a tireless self-promoter the, the last term a useless mischief maker but he had keen political instincts 
there's an image there of Hosea and Mrs. King. And they were not the best of friends. And he says that his disdain for Mrs. King really began after her husband was killed. So when King was killed, a lot of organizations donated money to the SCLC. But King did not have a will. And so as his uh, next of kin, Mrs. King received all of the money that was written in King's name. And Hosea and others in King's inner circle always argued that Ms. King did not give more to the movement. Instead, she wanted to establish her own center, which she did. But as a balanced approach, Mrs. King did donate proceeds and perform concerts to benefit the SCLC. But Williams was known to clash with what he called the downtown power structure. If you drive through Atlanta, you see the names of Jesse Hill. You see the names of others who were affluent black men who had uh, accumulated a degree of wealth, power, and influence. Those were the ones who hated Hosea Williams, and Hosea likewise hated in return. Particularly Maynard Jackson. Maynard Jackson, of course, the first black mayor of a major southern city. Um, Andrew Young, though Young wrote the foreword for this book, and they were movement brothers, they did fight. They threw punches. Um, Herman Russell, of course, Herman Russell, the renowned builder and architect in Atlanta. Um, and he certainly did not like Jimmy Carter. And if Jimmy Carter was honest, I'm sure he would say the same thing about Hosea. But Williams also knew when to collaborate when it suited his interests. Here again, uh, Mrs. King and Hosea are collaborating uh, in the wake of the march in Forsyth in 1987. Now, Hosea was not broke. Over a 13-year period, though Jose was a preacher, he ran a successful bingo operation. And according to the AJC, there was no any indication that, that any money ever went to Williams after an IRS forensic audit. So either Hosea Williams was an accountant and we didn't know about it, or he really did use the money for causes in which they were intended. Um, I will say that I'm silent on the matter. But what you see to the right of the screen is a chart of all of the organizations in what the AJC called Hosea Williams' network. So he had a chemical company. He was the president. Again, he had a background in chemistry, so he ran his own chemical company. Um, he had other developmental agencies that he used to fund money to support this, uh, other protests in the city. But again, he was ingenious in ways organizing and fundraising. So um, the case for Jose Williams as a first ballot founding father. In 2013, I remember vividly working for Mrs. Ms. King at the King Center, and John Meacham sends a signed autograph of this magazine in which King is recognized as a founding father. Now, beneath that, Meacham says that King was the architect of the 21st century. Now, that is a profound statement to make when King never lived to see the 21st century. So if King was considered to be an architect of the 21st century dying in 1968, what about some of the others who played roles in activism far beyond 1968? This is what Lewis said about Hosea Williams. So Hosea must be looked upon as one of the founding fathers of the new America. Through his actions, he helped liberate all of us. Bill Clinton, an American foot soldier and driving force behind the Voting Rights Act. Hosea was a profile in courage. He dedicated his entire life to making sure that we never take a detour on the road to freedom. So I ask this question. How would Hosea be portrayed if he had a chauffeur? Because many of Hosea's 
uh, the complaints against his character were related to him being in an automobile behind the wheel. But there are twists to that. Number one, um, I watched Jose Williams' funeral a few years ago. And um, Bill Campbell, who was the mayor at the time, who also served on the city council with Williams in the 1980s, said, Dr. Fowler, would you please stand? Dr. Fowler was the physician who treated Hosea while he was battling cancer. So, again, I say this was a providential project. Dr. Fowler is the father of one of my junior high school classmates, Brandy. So I reached out to Brandy on Facebook and I said, Brandy, can I have a conversation with your father? And so she connected us and I knew about the cancer, but I did not know that Hosea Williams had other elements that caused him to go to sleep while he was driving. He had number one sleep apnea. All right. Now, the family always said this, but, you know, families are often very protective of the legacies of their loved ones. Now, if I was writing on someone who lived 200 years ago and the immediate family members were not around, I could maybe take a different approach. But I wanted to be sure that he had other challenges that directly impacted his driving. So it was not always alcohol. Now, his his alcohol of choice, he loved gin. He loved gin and a tonic. Now, there were times in which he was pulled over and there were open containers in the vehicle. So I'm not going to say that he is completely absolved from practicing uh, unwise judgment behind one of his many Cadillacs. But that does not take away from the fact that Jose Williams, despite um, his vices, played a crucial role to the modern civil rights movement and, of course, many years thereafter. This is one person named Chris Dickinson. I don't know who Chris is, but this is what he said. Williams is persecuted. He's hounded by the press. What about the Thanksgiving turkey drives he does for the hungry? Now, keep in mind that Jose Williams, a guy approaches him in 1971 for some money to get him something to eat. So Jose said, well, I don't trust you. He goes into a restaurant and gives him a fish sandwich. He gives the man a sandwich and the man is eating the sandwich so rapidly he's eating the paper because he's hungry. So that forced Jose Williams to start a charity that is still in existence today, the Jose Williams Feed the Hungry and Homeless. And it started in a basement of the Wheat Street Baptist Church uh, there in Atlanta. And as I said earlier, up to this date, that charity has served more than one million free meals. Um, so Chris said that we should spend less time criticizing Mr. Williams and more time praising him. Um, I don't know if I agree with the last statement. I think uh, when we criticize people, we are able to figure out and, and dissect their contributions objectively. So when I go to services, and if you grew up in a Baptist church, at the end of the service, there's always the invitation to discipleship. Now, that's around a time when I was a little boy, I would get excited because I knew we were about to go home <laughs> after a very long sermon. But an invitation to agitation is what I ask of us to consider. We know of people who have spilled their blood and lost their lives for the causes of liberty, equality, injustice. And I know we've heard the phrase before, some say that it is trite, but I think it is also true. Um, King said, where do we go from here? I ask, where, where do we go from here? We are living in an era right now where there is certain uncertainty. And I'm taking that quote from a professor who teaches at UNC Chapel Hill. He teaches business. He said, this is a period of certain uncertainty. Every time we turn on the news, there is a crisis. CNN so much so, they have breaking news on the screen all day, every day. Um, in, in an era in which there is so much social and political upheaval, there's this sense of nationalism that has been renewed since the election of the last president. These are realities that as a nation, we are going to have to address. And people would often ask me, well, Rice, what would Hosea say if he was still here? 
he may clearly say that we've made some significant gains, but then when you look at the data, you one would see that um, wealth inequality um, has in, in increased. Um, you will see that the top 5% of the nation's wealthy people still own 95% of the capital. We'll see that um, the uh, educational gains, one was still question, has that been enough since so many progressive measures have changed education? So again, what is, what, what are, what is this generation going to do? Is this going to be our invitation to agitation? But as I close, um, for years I had the Android, all right? And my wife and I and her siblings and their children, we all went to Hilton Head a few weeks ago to celebrate her parents' 50th wedding anniversary. So um, I don't know if I share with you all, but I have four children, Madison, Marley, Rolandus II, and Remington. And if you can tell by my energy, just imagine what my baby boy is. So we're on a little cruise and he's running around on the boat. My mother-in-law is going crazy. She says, Ro, don't let that boy fall into the water. Well, Rory didn't fall, but my phone did. <laughs> and so I'm in South Carolina. So I said, I need to get me another device. And so I bought an Apple phone. And when someone would call me, and you all have an Apple phone in the room, there's a little prompt at the top of the screen that says slide to answer. And I would argue that we must slide things in or out of our lives to answer the call. And I have slide in quotation marks and I also have call in quotation marks. Jose Williams, Andrew Young, James Bevel, Richard Boone, Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, and so many others believe that they were being called for a purpose. Um, and it showed in the fact in their sacrifices. And as I, I go to the last slide, um, as a father and a husband, I often ask myself, if I was called for such a purpose, would I accept it? Would I be willing to risk my house being bombed? Would I be willing for my children to see gory images of a bullet through my brain in a newspaper or a television? Uh, these men and women, they knew of the possibilities, but they accepted the call anyway. So Jose Williams, a lifetime defiance and protest. Thank you. Dr. Rice, thank you very much. Uh, we will take some questions from the audience in a second. Let me just also say that for our uh, friends who are watching online, if you have a question for Dr. Rice, you can post it in the comments. We can take a look at that as well. I want to start off with a question, if I could. Sure. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about your discussion and what I appreciate about the, the portions of your book I've been able to read thus far is how, you know, as, as we saw today, you talk about Jose Williams as a man, mm -hmm. as a man with feet of clay, like all men and women have. And I sure. wonder um, the the personality conflicts, the 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 questions over tactics that happen with with that group of people that you showed <laughs> in the photograph. So many of those people also have that post 1960s orbit in Atlanta. Sure. And so they're all still around each other in the 70s and 80s and even onward. So what is the dynamic like between just, just two. Let's say Hosea Williams and uh, John Lewis and and Andrew Andrew Young after 1968. You know that was a very good question, and one I spent a lot of time trying to weed through. I'll also throw in Joseph Lowry if you don't mind. Sure. So Joseph Lowry, he fires Hosea Williams in 1979 as the executive director of SCLC. Well, at the time, Joseph Lowry was also on the board of trustees at MARTA. And so Jose was leading protests against Marta. Now, mind you, Joe Lowry is Jose's boss. And he would often say, Jose, you can't put down the microphone for the lapel mic. I mean, the bullhorn for the lapel mic. He refused to do it. Jose Williams and his very good friend Tyrone Brooks. Tyrone Brooks was a state legislator and really his mentee. 
And Tyrone Brooks, he said, well, Hosea, he, he fights for the crazies. He said, the crazies, plural, they are the salt of the movement. And you cannot have a sustained movement without the crazies of, 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 of the movement. And Andrew Young talks about this in the introduction. The biggest contention was always between Hosea Williams and James Bevel. And um, Hosea says that it started in 1964 in St. Augustine when he said Bevel tried to kill the movement. And then a year later in Selma, Hosea believed that he had been tricked by Bevel. And he said, well, you know, King said you can go ahead and have the march. And of course, King did, did not say that he could lead the march. But a lot of people do not remember speaking, changing a little bit. Hosea and John Lewis actually served on the city council for a time together. A brief time in the 1980s before Lewis um, drops, he, he decides to run for Congress. He loses the first time and then wins, I believe, the second time. But in Atlanta, you know, you had a very conservative black middle and upper middle class, and they believe that we're, we're, we're post-civil rights movement, and there are other effective ways of being an agent of meaningful change if you want to address social and political equality. Jose Williams, again, he was an organic intellectual. He just did not believe that. Now, the funny part is Jose Williams was as wealthy as the rest of them. And so he, he was of the, the middle class or even at some point the upper middle class, but he could never separate himself from what consumed him. And that was in your face activism. Um, him and Andrew Young, he always called Andrew Young the Uncle Tom. And as Young calls it, he says, well, King often used the Hegelian dialectic as a way to reach decisions. He said, well, um, truth is not found in the thesis or the antithesis, but a synthesis of both sides. So he would have Jose Williams on one side, one extreme, and King would say, well, Andy, I'm going to need you on one side to give me a little latitude to come back on the more conservative approach. And so he relied on them both. Um, but there were times in which King, oh, I'm sorry, Jose and Andrew Young did come to blows. And Young says in the introduction that they came to blows many times. And Young always felt that he was unfairly criticized uh, for being soft, but that was his role. He knew it and he played it. Again, he was the diplomat of the group, and we know what happened post-68. Uh, Young is ambassador to the UN, also two-term mayor of Atlanta. Hope I answered your question. You did. Thank you. Question from the audience? And I love the fact that you came to give us the story of Hosea Wade. And you made the statement, well, would I be the one to step forward if, if um, you know, I knew that my house would be bombed? All right. But you are not the one to step forward for that reason. You're the one to step forward for the reason of bringing our history forward. And you're doing that very well. So a lot of times there are so many young people who it's their they're supposed to step forward and get these stories, but they won't do it. The house is not gonna be bombed or anything like that, but they're they're not forceful and, and keeping these stories alive. So I commend you wow. uh, for doing this. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. You're very kind. And as I think about what you said and I see your, you know, I'll say black and gold, um, that, that really started at Alabama State University for me. Um, again, studying in the Department of History and Political Science, but also working with uh, Dr. Franklin and Dr. Robinson in the Center, Center for Civil Rights and African American Culture. Um, I had the good fortune of studying in the classroom, but also working with the center at the same time. And if you all know my old supervisor, she was not one um, to, to, to not really be demanding. She demanded a lot, but she demanded excellence from me. And it was just seeing her bringing, or the center rather, bringing people to the National Center, Reverend Boone, uh, Reverend Grass, and so many others. I was able to shake hands and speak to these people who lived this. 
And so the, the least I could do was try to tell an accurate story. Maybe someone will come behind me and revise it and do it better. That's okay. At least somebody, I gave them a foundation to start. Good question here. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. One thing that just came to mind is that, you know, if we go to every city almost, you see Martin Luther King Boulevard. Sure. And I'm sure in, in Atlanta, you see other, like Andrew Jackson, you'll see a boulevard for him. So Hosea Williams, is it is it the powers to be who make the decision of whose name gets to be on the street sign or, or building? Because I don't ever recognize his name being any place historically on buildings or streets? You raise a very good question. Um, I mentioned uh, Dr. Brondish. Dr. Brondish wrote a book called The Southern Pass. And Brondish says that you can very often tell by the people who's in power when you look at street names. So when you are in Atlanta, you see um, the Abernathy Freeway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see Jesse Hill Boulevard, and of course, Martin Luther King Jr. And it was not until 2000, the summer of 2000, that the city of Atlanta decided to rename a street in honor of Hosea Williams. It was once Boulevard, and now it is, I think, a three-mile stretch name, Hosea Williams. And at the time, it was in a very um, impoverished neighborhood. And now, due to gentrification, Jose Williams' house right now at 8 East Lake is worth over a million dollars. Now, 20, 25 years ago, folks in this room may not be jumping up and down to move into the East Lake area. Um, but should there be greater recognition of Jose Williams and his contributions? Certainly. Should there be a recognition of him in Selma? I think so. There's, there's this talk about renaming the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You all are familiar with those debates far more than I am. Um, and, and I won't go into details on all of the arguments that I've heard, but I think Jose's name deserves to be in that conversation. If you're going to have a debate about renaming as a historian, I wouldn't recommend renaming anything because I think monuments and bridges, they help to tell a story. Um, but at the same time, I do think his name deserves to be in the conversation of honor and Selma. Okay. The second question was your books. Where, where do we get those? Oh, now that's the question I like to answer. <laughs> um, Walmart, Target, um, certainly the, the uscpress.com and the Amazon. And it's also an audible book. So if you want to listen to it while you are driving, um, it is not my voice, uh, a much better voice than mine. Um, so you shouldn't go to sleep. But I certainly I appreciate your support. <laughs> We'll take one question from Dr. Caver in the end, but I will say also that the book will soon be available to purchase on the online museum store website, which is alabamaoriginals.com. So those are, those are on order. They'll be here soon. So Dr. Awesome. Caver's going to close Thank you for your support. Dr. Rice, uh, as you may recall, I'm the one that referred you to the ADC. That's you did. <laughs> you sure did. And, of course, I had an ulterior motive. <laughs> to organize the papers at the Alabama Democratic Conference. You did. Uh, I'm currently working on that collection at ASU. It is voluminous. Her. And mixed with the records of the Alabama State Teachers Association. Oh, yeah. So it's a monumental task. And hopefully in a couple of years, you will be able to peruse that collection and get better understanding of the ADC and the Alabama State Teachers Association. Best of luck to you. Well, it certainly deserves a full and treatment, um, and I'm hopeful that uh, a precocious and devoted scholar will have access to that and really tell the story of those organizations. Um, I think story long overdue. Well, I don't think we can say it any better than uh, Mary Boone did uh, just a moment ago. Thank you, Ms. Boone. So we appreciate you, Dr. Rice, for coming today and talking to us about Jose Williams. And uh, thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Be well. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. <laughs>